to tell the story of Paul McGuinness, I've got to tell another story. So bear with me while I give this introduction. In about the mid 70s, I became friendly with a, a man called Bob Giles. He was pretty much a foundation member of the Royal Aero Club, joining in 1929 and learning how to fly in 1930. He and I got on very well together and we talked a lot of aviation history. And one day he said to me, you know, one of the most qualified aviators in Australia is buried at Karakata and not many people know about it. And he uh, was a, a farmer in Western Australia. And I thought, oh, who's that? And he said, uh, Paul McGuinness. And I said, never heard of him. <clears throat> so there was a lot of things I hadn't heard of. So anyway, <clears throat> um, I always kept an ear open and an eye out for information on Paul McGuinness. It turned out that Bob Giles, in 1929 and 30, was a cadet journalist uh, with the WA newspaper doing the police round. And um, when he got his license, he became the aviation correspondent for the newspaper. And so he talked to and interviewed virtually every aviator in Western Australia and anyone of note that visited uh, went under the microscope with Bob. I couldn't believe the knowledge that he had uh, on aviation history. Anyway, I compiled a file on Paul McGuinness and about three years ago I was in the public library at Perth and I just happened to mention to a librarian, do you have anything on a person called Paul McGuinness? And the bloke said, well, let's go and have a look. So he took me over to a, a drawer, pulled out a folder and said, have a read of that. And there were half a dozen pages on Paul McGuinness. Most of it was a surprise to me. And so I read it, and at the end of it, it said there were five wallets of information upstairs which you could get hold of and have a look at. So I went upstairs and got the five wallets and went through them, and I was surprised what was in there. Letters to and from Qantas, uh, an address book, friends, family, all sorts of information. It was almost as if someone had cleaned out a bottom drawer and put five stacks of information into various little heaps. But on one of the sheets of paper it said, if you need to copy any of this, you need the approval and permission of a Mrs. Pauline Cottrell. And it gave a phone number, so I rang that number and no one there by that name. <coughs> the person, Mrs. Cottrell, had moved on. So I went through the phone book and finally got to the Mrs. Cottrell, who turned out to be Paul McGuinness's daughter. Unfortunately, she passed away about two years ago. I visited her and said to her, I've got a fair bit of information on your father. And she said, well, I've got a fair bit too. So we put our heads together and came up with a fair bit of information. And that's what I'm going to show you now, uh, what I've learned about Paul McGuinness. He came from Warrnambool, a place called Framlingham, about 15 kilometres north, northeast of Warrnambool. His grandfather um, developed a fairly large property there and left the family in a fairly good state financially. Like many others, Paul uh, was there on the spot when World War I broke out. He was born in 1894 and was 18. Uh, when in 1914. So he joined the 8th Light Horse and spent some months learning the basics of being a soldier uh, on horseback. He left on that ship in March 1915 and headed for uh, the uh, Middle East. Being a light horseman, he was headed for Palestine. But when they got to Palestine, they said there's a new front on and uh, this place is called Gallipoli and uh, you blokes have been separated from your horses and you're off to Gallipoli. So that's how he ended up there. He wasn't there long and he was promoted to corporal. He evidently was good on his feet, thought well and uh, handled himself well under uh, trying conditions. At Gallipoli he was hit three times by bullets. One in the heel of his boot, which damaged the boot but not him. Another one drew blood, where he was very lucky, and another one got him just above the hip, where he had to, at least two layers of webbing, and the bullet was deflected, but it knocked him out 
uh, spun him around and knocked him out. This happened at a dawn patrol when he was out scouting. He didn't come to till 10.30 in the morning and uh, he knew that if he moved he was going to get shot by the Turks. So he had to stay there all day and not move. Flies, insects, thirst and eventually he knew when the sun went down it was going to be a dark patch because the moon wasn't coming up for an hour and a half after sundown. So he waited for that time, then up on his feet and scampered to his own line. At Gallipoli, he received the Distinguished Conduct Medal, which is uh, for conspicuous gallantry and a very highly regarded award. In the citation, it doesn't mention exactly what he got it for, but I'll tell you a grisly story which may have had something to do with it. One of the officers in his battalion was shot and in, was in no man's land. And so Paul McGuinness and three other soldiers decided to go and retrieve the body. So they waited for a dark night, went out, retrieved the body, and when they got it back to their lines, uh, the head was missing. And so Paul volunteered to go and retrieve the head on his own, which he did. When he got back, with the head, the other three people who were helping had been shot by the Turks. So by him taking on that, that job, it saved his life. So there's the medal, proudly presented. <clears throat> he was one of the last out of Gallipoli, leaving within about two hours of the total close down. He went back to Palestine and in the Eighth Light Horse worked or fought in some of the towns that are mentioned there. He was very keen on joining the Australian Flying Corps and applied to join in 1917 and got knocked back. And someone said to him, the CO here doesn't like people joining the Australian Flying Corps, what you should do is leave this eighth light horse and join the sixth light horse where they had more success. So he joined the sixth light horse. He'd been promoted to quartermaster sergeant but forsook that position to go back to fighting with his friends. Anyway, he was accepted by uh, the Australian Flying Corps and his CO uh, allowed him to leave and that's him uh, with some of the other pilots in that early intake. One of them is Henry Blake, uh, who was a West Australian. That's the record of his progress while he was training to be a pilot. All entries are good or very good. He soloed on a, a Morris Farm and Shorthorn. September 1917, he went through the military aeronautics flying course. October, advanced flying. <clears throat> October, graduated as a pilot. And in October, went through aerial gunnery. He was a bit of a natural. Being a man from the land who was good at shooting, shooting targets on the moon, rabbits and that sort of thing, he found that shooting another aircraft was pretty easy going. He shot down seven aircraft. In the centre column, you'll note who his observer is. Oh, a bloke by the name of Fish. Hudson Fish was in the back of the aeroplane with him. A Fletcher, there's plenty of Fletchers here. <coughs> and then Fish again, Fish again, Fish again. <coughs> so Paul McGuinness as pilot and Hudson Fish became part of a team. You can see in the image there that the observer on occasions had a gun, machine gun, to shoot aircraft down. So some of those kills would have come from Hudson Fish. And in other photos you might notice that there's a, a gun right in front of Paul McGuinness's face. Uh, so he could shoot aircraft down as well. One notable hit that he got was where he shot down a German aircraft at the top of the loop. The maximum 
uh, sorry, the score that he got seven uh, was just below the maximum for the Middle East, which was nine, even though people on the Western Front got up to 25. Um, Paul McGuinness became an ace. Anything over five is an ace, and so he was an ace pilot with a DCM, a pretty rare bird. That's him and Paul McGuinness, sorry, Paul McGuinness and Hudson Fish in their aircraft. They started off with pretty crummy aircraft and when they got the Bristol Tourer, they were on equal footing with the Germans. <coughs> the dog there belonged to Pard Mustard if you follow early aviators. The aircraft was provided by a Mr. McCacky, an Australian pastoralist of Irish descent, and he had tons of money and he bought that aircraft as some other uh, businessmen in Australia did at the time. Their mechanic was a man named Arthur Baird. <coughs> if you've read any books on Qantas, you might know that Arthur Baird was the chief engineer in Qantas over many, many years. And so McGuinness and Fish both got a DSC. Different citations and different reasons. So McGuinness was a bit of a king with a DFC and a DCM. At the, towards the end of the war, they decreed that observers would be given a chance to learn how to fly. And so Hudson Fish took that up. He underwent his flying training in the late stages of 1918 when the outcome was inevitable. And he left Palestine with 35 hours in his logbook and returned to Australia. McGuinness came back to Australia with over 500 hours in his logbook. While he was in the Australian Flying Corps, he worked in other areas. He got to know many other Australian pilots, but he and Ross Smith were assigned to Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia needed to buy the favour of the Arabs, and so it was necessary for the Allies to put on a demonstration to show what their firepower was like in strafing what their bombing prowess was like, could they hit the enemy target, and the Arabs also needed money to make them change their mind, so they flew a lot of gold around the place. And so they communicated with Lawrence of Arabia uh, quite a bit. On the way, uh, sorry, in Letters Home, McGuinness had mentioned that he'd love to start a flying organisation in Australia. On the ship, on the way home, a nose was pinned up on the board to say that the Australian government was sponsoring an air race from England to Australia. So McGuinness went to Fish and said, we've been a good team in Palestine, well, do you want to join me? And Fish said yes. He then went to Baird and said, you've been a top mechanic, would you support us, come with us? And he said yes. So that became the team for the air race. Back in Australia, they saw their families and then got together to sort out how the air race was going to be conducted and run from their point of view. McGuinness realised that he needed financial backing, so he went to Makaki, the man that provided the aeroplane in the Middle East. And he received an agreement uh, for him to provide the aircraft and costs en route. Baird agreed to become a mechanic, so the old team was back in business. Unfortunately, McCacky passed away, and the people that looked after the estate, the lawyers, said, we know there was an agreement, but there's nothing on paper, and therefore uh, your handshake doesn't count. And so McGuinness was, and his friends were out of a job. So their entry was withdrawn, and left Lego, uh, who was looking after the event, offered McGuinness the job of doing the survey because they had aircraft arriving in Darwin in this air race, but then they had to get from Darwin down to was it Sydney at the end, and they had to get through Queensland. 
and there were no aerodromes in Queensland at that stage. So McGuinness took on the job of doing the survey. Fish agreed to go with him and they couldn't get Baird because he'd been out of his job, back in his job, out of his job and he didn't want to ruin his chances of promotion or advancement. So he said, no, count me out. So they eventually got a boat called George Gorham to accompany them as their mechanic. So that's the three of them, Gorham, McGuinness and Fish. Note that McGuinness has got the pith helmet on. And so they found their way to Rockhampton. They got themselves a T-model Ford. They went to Longreach and started the survey. And in those boxes are the dates. It took them 51 days to traverse the distance to Darwin. There were no roads, they were using cattle tracks, crossing creeks and rivers. That's the, the car receiving help from locals. That's McGuinness in the fifth helmet, crossing a creek at the wheel. That's McGuinness in the fifth helmet on the horse, dragging the car across a creek. That's Hudson Fish sketching the countryside. And that's McGuinness in the hole with the pith helmet digging for water. They got to Darwin <coughs> and time was tight. They looked at two sites for an aerodrome. McGuinness left fish there to sort out the aerodrome at Darwin, which he did, and he did, efficient, and did it efficiently. They knew Ross and Keith Smith personally, and so it was friends meeting friends when they arrived. The initial route, which was suggested by the officials in Melbourne, was too far north and it was going through the wet, low lying country, and there's no room for an aerodrome at all in those parts of the state uh, and Northern Territory close to the Gulf of Carpentaria. So McGuinness came back via the green route on the map there. That's Hudson Fish talking to Ross Smith on arrival at Darwin at the end of the air race. The first and I think only aircraft to arrive. That photograph of the vehicle is not the vehicle used on the survey, even though the books that people write include that. That was the book, a vehicle that Fish used to return to Cloncurry. He hitched a ride with two other people, and that was the vehicle. And they covered the same route pretty well that McGuinness covered with uh, Gorham, the man who was uh, their mechanic. And so McGuinness got to Cloncurry, <coughs> and while he was there, he had a bit of time on his hands. He sorted out the aerodrome, cleared it and prepared it for the arrival of the air race aircraft. While he was there, one Sunday he was going to a picnic in the T-Model Ford and he came across a man who had driven at a reasonably high speed into the creek and had uh, bent a tie rod in the suspension of the T-Model Ford. So he gave this bloke a hand quickly whipped off the tyre rod, drove it into town, straightened it with a bit of oxy heating, went back and put it on. And it turned out that this bloke was a chap called McMaster. That name crops up in the Qantas history as well. While McGuinness was waiting there, he looked at the railheads coming in from the coast. And if anyone wanted to go from Cloncurry to Longreach or somewhere like that, it entailed a trip to the coast by train, down the coast, by train back inland, and it could take a week to get from one railhead to the next. So he went ahead with this idea of developing a, an air service that connected those railheads. And so that's how Qantas came into being. They started a different company under a different name, but it eventually became Qantas. McGuinness 
said that he needed financial help, and just as McCackie had helped him earlier on, he asked if there was anyone in the district who was financial, and someone said, well, why don't you try a bloke called McMaster? And he said, yeah. right. So out he went and spoke to McMaster, and McMaster agreed to support the venture. So that's where the, the money came from, and instead of being just a, a one-man show, and you might appreciate up to this time, McGuinness had been a one-man show. Everything he was attempting was coming off. But now he ended up part of a company where there was company secretaries, shareholders. He was good at raising money. A man called Clements was engaged to raise money, and McGuinness accompanied him. They went from place to place, raising funds. And of course, you can imagine how successful McGuinness would have been. This man is a pilot. They were so rare in those days. This man has a, a DCM, very rare. This man is a, a World War I veteran. Not very rare, but very popular people in those days. And so McGuinness and Clements were able to raise quite a lot of money for Qantas, very successful in their venture. They purchased their first aircraft. McGuinness flew the first aerial medical service, I think, in Australia. But <coughs> the management decided that they wanted all of their pilots to be teetotal. And McGuinness said, well, do you mean not drinking before a flight? And they said, no, teetotal, no alcohol whatsoever. And he said, well, I can't subscribe to that, so I'll help you out until things get on their feet and I'll be on the way. So. A fortnight after Qantas officially got going, McGuinness left. And that was the citation that they gave him. They also gave him a cigarette case, <coughs> uh, silver engraved. Thank you. And, oh, sorry, I called him Clements. It was actually Clarkson. Clarkson was the fundraiser. And Clarkson had been in Western Australia raising funds. And when he heard that McGuinness was out of a job with Qantas, he said, why don't you come over to Western Australia? and uh, helped me out, raising some funds. We did pretty well as a team uh, in Queensland. We can do the same in WA. So McGuinness came to Western Australia, and it was something to do with agriculture, and maybe the Agricultural Bank of Western Australia, which eventually became Rural Industries and um, Bank West. There's a connection historically there. Whether it's direct or not, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, the Minister for Agriculture was a Mr. Charles Baxter. Anyone remember Trevor Baxter down the road here? It was his grandfather. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> McGuinness had a lot to do with the Minister for Agriculture, and so much so that he was going around there for dinner of an evening and eventually married his daughter. <laughs> Put him in a good spot for a, a grant for a, a block of land. <laughs> So he purchased a farm out of Morrower in Western Australia in about 1925. He worked himself very, very hard on the farm. It was successful. He survived through the Depression, but by about 1933, things were going bad. His marriage broke up. But it's interesting to note that the little building on the Morrower airfield is called the Paul McGuinness Building. And not many people would appreciate that it's dedicated to him. So he sold out the farm in about 1933, but in that time he came down to Perth on often occasion and even flew at the forerunner of this club, the Australian Aero Club, got to know Bob Giles very well. Uh, they became firm friends. And he even flew back to the farm a couple of times in a gypsy moth. There's a photo of a gypsy moth he would have flown. And there's the Sierra Autogyro. And McGuinness's wife is in the cockpit of that uh, aircraft. So after the marriage breakup, uh, McGuinness sold the farm, left Western Australia without very much money, and went back to Victoria. World War II came along. He was inducted as an officer. He went into training, he was too old to be a pilot. So he went uh, into flying training, but not as an instructor, 
pilot training in Milne Bay and uh, Melbourne accident investigation and eventually discharged in 1944. After the war, he launched into a number of things. He was uh, airport manager at, uh, in Tasmania and uh, overstepped the mark there. He employed a, a typist and the department said that you'd, you're not allowed to employ typists. We only employ you, not supplementary staff. So he got into trouble there. He tried to open up an air beef scheme well ahead of his time. He grew tobacco in Queensland and the doctor said to him, this weather's no good for you, you need to go to a cooler climate. So he went down to Nornalup and started farming down there, farming tobacco. He got ill down there and by this time his life had started to deteriorate a bit. He wasn't that well organised. He'd been separated from his family, and when he got sick down there, he came to Perth and ended up in Hollywood Hospital in the bed alongside of Bob Giles. <laughs> the two of them had lots and lots of talks about aviation in the early days. And so McGuinness got out of bed one day to go down uh, to the telephone, which was in a, a passageway, collapsed at the telephone, came back to the bed and passed away alongside of Bob Giles. Bob Giles couldn't go to the funeral, but he dispatched, oh, what was his name, another journalist, um, I think of his name, but his deputy virtually uh, attended the funeral. McGuinness hadn't filled out very many forms when he joined the hospital, or went to the hospital, and there weren't many records of who his next of kin were, and they virtually had no one to notify. And at his funeral, there were very few people there. Five, I think. Lloyd Lawson was the journalist who was dispatched by Bob Giles to uh, attend the funeral. <coughs> a couple of family members and a priest were the only ones there. The people over east <coughs> didn't hear about it for quite some number of months. His family at Warrenville and Qantas didn't hear about it either. The family weren't endeared with him, and so they didn't do very much about a headstone. But when the family did hear about it, they, sorry, when Qantas did hear about it, they arranged for a rather magnificent headstone. As far as I know, that building is called the McGuinness Building, so Qantas haven't forgotten him. That is the hangar at Cloncurry, the place where he got his ideas. And that's the, the plaque at Karakata. This plaque was erected in remembrance of uh, Ginty, that was his nickname, um, by QEA Limited as a tribute to his great part in the pioneering foundation of the uh, Queensland and Northern Territory Aerial Service Limited, established in Queensland. November 1920. So that's the story of Paul McGuinness. Thank you very much. Thank you.